The 12th Ministerial Conference of the World Trade Organization is set to take place in Geneva and Switzerland from June 12th to 15th. There are a number of issues on the agenda, but the one which has received the most attention is the question of the trade-related intellectual property rights waiver or the TRIPS waiver on COVID-19 related products. The proposal was first introduced by India and South Africa in 2020. It seeks to waive certain intellectual property rights on vaccines, tests and medicines. However, ever since the proposal came up, there has been stiff resistance from rich countries who are unhappy at the commercial implications. This is even as only 13% of the population in low-income countries has been vaccinated. What is the history of this proposal and what have been the negotiations so far? Anna Rachar of the People's Health Dispatch explains. TRIPS waiver proposal was, was first tabled in October 2020 by India and South Africa at the World Trade Organization. And what India and South Africa sought to do at the time uh, was lifting intellectual and intellectual property uh, prerogatives uh, on COVID-19 uh, products. So it included vaccines, it included testing, it included the medication that would be used uh, in the fight against COVID-19. So uh, this has dragged on for quite a bit of time and essentially it boils down to opposition by rich countries and the rich countries are opposing the TRIPS waiver largely because of uh, pressure by the pharmaceutical companies, by Big Pharma, uh, which is uh, stationed in the global north uh, and which is basically uh, increasing its influence and exerting its influence over the governments and the delegations that are attending the WTO, um, the WTO uh, negotiations. So uh, because of this, what we have seen over the past 18 months or, or a bit more uh, is that the original waiver is uh, being sidelined, sidelined uh, and in, instead of the original, we are seeing uh, alternative versions, what are called compromise versions or statements coming from, uh, from the global north, essentially from the European Union. And these versions are uh, much more restrictive uh, and much more limited in what uh, what they're aiming to do or, to, or uh, what they're saying that they're aiming to do. Uh, and of course, one of the most recent examples of such, uh, such an alternative version coming up was just a couple of months ago uh, when uh, a, um, a, a text was leaked uh, by the European Union which was presented as the outcome of negotiations from a small group of countries, uh, which included the EU, the US, India, and South Africa. Uh, and it was presented as an alternative text on which the group had agreed and wanted to table at the WTO. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, it turned out that this, this version did not enjoy the support of uh, even those members who took part in the negotiations. So uh, up to this day, uh, only the EU uh, has essentially and explicitly uh, said it supported such a text. But on the other hand, uh, this text seems to, uh, you know, have hit a note with the WTO leadership. And so uh, this limited and uh, quite limiting text, uh, text is what we're seeing being discussed at the moment by the delegation as they approach the 12th ministerial conference, uh, which is set to start uh, on the 12th of June. The TRIPS waiver is no mere policy prescription or legal clause. It has concrete effects for millions of people across the world. What are the ways in which the TRIPS waiver could benefit people? What kind of positions have countries in the global south taken against the aggressive lobbying by the rich countries? In, in the case of this new alternative version, uh, what's, uh, what's being discussed uh, is basically uh, what already exists and what is already covered under TRIPS flexibilities. So that's one of, uh, of the biggest problems that has been uh, underlined by Global South delegations and basically by civil society, uh, because they are saying that uh, what the Global North is pushing for uh, will not make it easier for them to actually uh, use the, the flexibilities uh, and um, increase uh, access to vaccines. So uh, for example, for example, uh, we have seen that uh, the UK and Switzerland, Switzerland in particular are trying to put pressure on. So um, when we talk about lifting patents under such a decision uh, or the waiver, uh, it, it, 
they wanted to mean that to apply for a waiver, a producer should list all the patents that are included uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the final product in the vaccine. So this is not such a simple thing. It's actually a very complicated thing because uh, vaccines and other products, they, uh, they're, they're impacted and they're shaped uh, under, the, under the influence of many patents. So for someone to be able to list them all, uh, they should put in quite a bit of effort, and uh, this would discourage the this would discourage the producers to actually try and implement such um, such such a measure. On the other hand, we're also seeing that the global north delegations are pushing. Uh, they're actually uh, advocating for compul compulsory licensing, uh, which already exists as I've said, under the TRIPS uh, flexibilities, but they're very rarely used because uh, it's, uh, it's a long process to, uh, to apply for them. And also because, uh, especially in the global South, the governments are put under pressure by the rich countries and by the pharma industry to actually give up and not, uh, not go down this road. And so uh, what we're seeing is that the rich countries are saying, you know, these things that we have, uh, essentially compulsory, compulsory licensing will be enough to increase, uh, should be enough to increase access to, vac to COVID-19 vaccines. And we really shouldn't uh, look at anything else. One, uh, there are a couple of more things which the current uh, alternative decision uh, seems to incorporate and that uh, that's a time limit. So it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be a general waiver, but it would have a time frame in which it can be applied. Uh, it's a bit unclear what happens. What ha so what happens after this time is up? So how how do we approach that? Uh, and an additional and final one of the uh, the additional problems is that it the rich countries, the global north, would like to uh, the waiver to be applied only for certain select selected countries, uh, and in a way that would exclude those countries which have produced. Um, that have ensured 10% or more of global supply in 2021. And so essentially this would mean that China is out of the game. And this has been an issue, a, prob a problem which has been raised uh, over and over again during the, the negotiations process. Of course, uh, the process has been very dragged on. So um, it's, uh, you know, uh, with the ministerial being so close and with the negotiations st still ongoing and with the information coming from the WTO uh, that the Global South is being increasingly uh, excluded from, uh, from the negotiations, uh, from the discussions, uh, that Global North delegations are threatening to actually walk out uh, if the Global South doesn't, doesn't toe the line. Uh, they have these information have caused uh, caused uh, like a, a round of uh, very intense reaction in civil society. So uh, ever since the compromise decision was leaked by the European Union, we have seen uh, civil society uh, and particularly trade justice and health justice activists raising their voice against uh, this compromise and saying that and pointing out that uh, actually if we have to you know, if we're looking at this kind of so-called waiver then it's better not to have a waiver at all because essentially it's even more limiting that uh, what uh, what we're asked to ask to rely on uh, now so um, there has been a round of protests announced uh, by civil society during the ministerial which will be starting around sunday uh, and um, in, a, in addition to that, of course, uh, calls remain for the Global South to uh, actually, you know, by some to walk out from, from such a negotiation and stand up to what the Global North is pushing for.